Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Alhamdulillah hirobil alamin. Wassalatu was uh, wassalatu wassalamu ala asrofil anbiya iwal musalim. Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in amma ba'du. First, let's say thank you to the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has bestowed all his graces, guidance, and gifts so that we can gather in the opening ceremony uh, webinar series, uh, Sustainability Action for Food, uh, Energy, and Economy, or we call it SAFE 2000, uh, 2024. And we always send a salawat and greeting to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam because of his rule model that we can live in the pride pride of Islamic era like today's. So honorable founder of the Ghazali project, in, uh, uh, the honorable founder of the Ghazali project of Asad Zaman, and achieve the Ghazali Project Chapter Indonesia, Dr. Lisa Listiana, respected guests, Dr. Adi Setia, and beloved committee, and my dear brothers and sisters that attend this webinar, who, uh, uh, who are glorified by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I welcome you all with, uh, I will explain the with uh with the following schedules of events, the first opening event was a more place for our webinar. Uh, the uh okay uh for opening we recite uh Bismillah and Al Fatiha together, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, and. And the next agenda, it will be a reading the recitation of Quran by Sister John uh, Kartini Rossi, uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayat 32. Uh, so, Sister John, time is yours. Thank you, Sister Putri. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Wa idha qala rabbuka lil malaikati inni ja'ilun fil aradi khalifah Qalu ataj'alu fiha may yufsidu fiha wa yasfiku dima Wa nahnu nusab bihu bihamdika wa nukat disulak. Qala inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. Dan ingatlah ketika Tuhanmu berfirman kepada para malaikat. Aku hendak menjadikan khalifah di bumi. Mereka berkata, apakah engkau hendak menjadikan orang yang merusak dan menumpahkan darah di sana, sedangkan kami bertasbih memujimu? dan menyucikan namamu. Dia berfirman, Sungguh aku mengetahui apa yang tidak kamu ketahui. Sadaqallahul azim. Jazakillah khair khatsiron for the beautiful recitation, Sister John. And before we start the lecture, uh, lecture and series, uh, I'm Putri Salaturahmi. As a moderator, we'll give a briefly explanation of our event, SAFE 2024, and it will be conducted in Bahasa to, to give a more, uh, to, to make uh, the audience more understandable, so it will be in Bahasa Indonesia. So, uh, SAFE. Uh, uh, SAFE 2024 merupakan program edukasi untuk 
pemberdayaan individu dan komunitas sebagai keberlanjutan dalam bidang ekonomi yang meliputi aktivitas pengadaan energi dan pangan sebagai kebutuhan pokok. Tema besar yang akan dibahas pada program ini adalah ekonomi Islam, antitesis dari ekonomi kapitalis, best practice community dalam bidang energi, dan best practice in community dalam bidang pangan, prinsip permakultur sebagai pendekatan yang mudah diaplikasikan oleh individu dan komunitas, dan yang terakhir adalah ekonomi isani. So, uh, uh, and also, uh, before, uh, so this is the explanation of the, uh, the explanation of uh, our program, and then for Dr. Lisa Listiana wants to give a, uh, a short a short description of our community, the Ghazali Project Indonesia. Okay, yes. Thank you, Sister Putri. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Robi sorry, sotri, wayasili amri, wardata milisan, ya kokoli. So, alhamdulillah, first of all, uh, praise to Allah for giving us opportunity to join in here. Um, so, uh, I welcoming uh, all the participants and thank you, uh, Jazakallah Khair, Professor Zamar, for like allocating your busy times and um, uh, would like to share the 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 knowledge uh, to us and also thank you for Dr. Adi for like uh, joining this session. So, inshallah, as mentioned by Dr. Putri, uh, Sister Putri, we will have uh, this program. This is the first time uh, we conducted the sustainability action on um, uh, energy, food, and economy. So um, maybe a glance for those who are the first time joining the Gozali Project program. So um, I, I I welcome you to visit our um, social media and also our website is back. So, Alhamdulillah, and uh, maybe a glance about the Gozali project. It starts from the nine-hour classes that I uh, attend. Uh, that that time, uh, Professor Zaman uh, gave a series lecture regarding the revival of Islam, uh, Islamic uh, revivals. And this um, nine hours lecture is also accessible. Is in not only Indonesia we have. Um, completed also the translation of the materials to Bahasa. So those who have an issue on the language can also access the, the, the materials in Bahasa. And uh, on the first time, and that was in two, 2021, the launching of the Gozali Project Indonesia. And we did the several uh, courses on the, uh, on Kitab, on uh related to uh, Al Ghazali and we also conducted Sunday talk that what that with uh, professor also monthly discussion and this time we would like to enhance not only for the course and like the discussion within the zoom uh, room we would like to visit and learn about the permaculture and um, as prof Asad also sometimes mentioned that it is too big to like to change all the system, maybe we can start from our community to do something different. And I, we hope that this uh, program can give benefit not only for us, the committee that would like to learn, but we also like really happy that um, the brother and system that joining this program hopefully can also get a lot of um, benefit from this. And we also welcome for any suggestion for the improvement for the upcoming program, inshallah. So thank you. And hopefully we can learn a lot of um, uh, beneficial, beneficial knowledge in this program. I beg to Sister Putri. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakallah khair katsir for Dr. Lisa Listiana for giving us a short, uh, expl a, sh a short explanation about our community and our program. So before we start also, I will read the curriculum vitae from Prof. Asad Zaman. So it's like uh, we, uh, the audience will, will know who is a Prof. Prof. As, a Prof Asad Zaman. So 
Prof. Asad Zaman, uh, the position half, the, the last position half is in the Vice Chancellor Pakistan Institute of Development Economics or PD Islamabad this uh, December 2013. And then uh, uh, General uh, uh, and then the wait for a while. Um, Uh, uh, um, Director General of uh, International Islamic University of Islamabad, 2003 to 2013. And then uh, Lahore of Management Science as a professor, Ju July 1990. 1990, uh, 1999 uh, to December 2002. And then uh, Prof. Prof. Zaman is a, a great alumni from the uh, PhD alumni from the Stanford University, uh, 1978. And then uh, Bachelor in Mathematics, Massachusetts, Institute of Technology, uh, 1974. So, uh, it's time to uh, to yours, Prof, to have the lecture series for us. Assalamualaikum. Uh, Prof, sorry, is still in mute. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before I start, I would like to explain about the so-called Ghazali project. First of all, um, the enlightenment of mankind started in 1445 years ago with the message of God that was received by our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, Allah Ta'ala gave mankind a knowledge which they did not have. So this Quran is unique knowledge which nobody else can have and uh, the um, Word of God, the information given by God is superior to anything that any human being could ever think of. So all knowledge produced by human beings from beginning of time to the end of time cannot have any comparison to the knowledge that was given by God in uh, the um, uh, Quran. And the Quran is the theoretical part and the living demonstration of the Quran is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So even if some part of the message is difficult to understand, then he explains it to us by living the Quran. So the last message of God, this is the final complete and perfect religion. And so that is the Uh, that is the uh, that is the enlightenment of mankind. But uh, what happened later was that the uh, for complex reasons, some of which we will discuss, the Europeans had. Um, centuries of battles between Catholics and Protestants. So they decided to build society uh, by excluding religion. So they said there will be religion leads to wars. 
And so we want to have some peace. So let's exclude religion from the um, from how we build a society. So then they invented secular knowledge, secular knowledge of economics, secular knowledge of politics, secular knowledge of all social institutions, so that they can build a society without God. So basically, this is what Western social science is. And now, for various reasons, they were under the illusion that this knowledge we are inventing is superior to all others. So they called this the enlightenment. And they said that all mankind was in darkness until the enlightenment of Europe when we rejected religion and we started using reason and observations. So then they, uh, for reasons again, which are complex, they managed to conquer the whole world. And uh, the Western systems of education, which teach that all real knowledge at this time is produced by European society, this is being taught to Muslims all over the world today. So as a result, Muslims are growing up with two different and conflicting claims. One is the claim of Allah Ta'ala himself, that the Quran is complete and perfect guidance for us until the Yawm al Qiyamah. And the other is the European claim that today the most advanced civilization in the world is European civilization. And the only way to make progress is to seek guidance from Western knowledge. There is no way to make development, make advance, make progress without Western knowledge. So this is directly in conflict with the uh, Quranic Dawa. So what they call the enlightenment of Europe is actually the endarkenment or the going from light to darkness, which Allah Ta'ala has described in the Quran. And they rejected God then the shayateen became their friends and they drove them out of the light into the darkness. And so today this is the central problem that today we are following very dark and ugly and ignorant ideas about how to build our society after rejecting religion. And this is the secular knowledge of economics. And, uh, and so, so the enlightenment the new enlightenment needed today is to understand that the Quran is still the most powerful and most valuable and most brilliant uh, knowledge that is available to all of mankind. So today, even Muslim students don't understand this because they have been brainwashed by their Western education. So Alhamdulillah, many Allah Ta'ala has revealed this to many Muslims who are working together. So this is the this is the enlightenment project, which is similar to what Imam Ghazali did when Greek knowledge became very popular and people were making the claim that Greek knowledge is just as good, just as important as the Quranic knowledge. So today, so he rejected, he did tahafatul philosophy and he said that all that is wrong and that there is, we need to, uh, rebuild Ahya Ulumuddin. We need to rebuild all of knowledge on Islamic foundations. So today, the same thing is needed. We need uh, today the vast majority of the Muslims think that the knowledge produced by the West is just as good, just as powerful, just as important as the knowledge in the Quran. This is because the Western education teaches us this. Because uh, in Western education, you uh, see nothing else. So what we need to do is to explain how the Western education is teaching us wrong ideas, false ideas. The economic theory that they uh, they teach is disastrously bad and extremely uh, fundamentally built on many mistakes. So we need to reject it completely and rebuild economics and all of the social sciences on Islamic foundations. And that is the... Ghazali project, because Imam Ghazali did it in his own time. Now, it is not correct to say that I am the founder of the Ghazali project. There are many, many, many people who have come to this realization, and people are working independently, just like the actual the European Enlightenment project. Many different people did different things and in different ways, 
And so I am working on some aspects and other people are working on other aspects and all of it is needed. So today I will be talking about a very specialized topic, how to rebuild economics on Islamic foundation. So to do politics and we need to do agriculture and we need to do education most importantly. And, and there are many other disciplines in which even, you know, the madrasa, the, the current madrasa is based on educational concepts borrowed from the West, not uh, on our, uh, not, uh, the madrasas today are not the types of madrasa which Imam Ghazali went to, which taught all knowledge. So today the madrasas are uh, following the secular idea that there is something called religious knowledge and there is something called worldly knowledge and these two are separate and our uh, job is to study the religious knowledge and the worldly knowledge we can ignore or leave uh, to others. So this is a big mistake, but it is commonly being made. So that's just for background. Now what I'm uh, for the talk today, I want to discuss uh, for about 20 years, I have been trying to uh, rebuild economics for, for a long time. I was just working on the La Ilaha part, showing how economics is bad. And then uh, for the past um, many years, I've been working on the illallah part. How do you build a new way of doing economics? So now actually I've taught two different courses uh, recently. And for some reason, the links that I had for it are not working, but I can provide the links later, inshallah. And so uh, what I would like to do is to um, explain how we can rebuild economics on new foundations. Um, so, mm, let's see now. I want to share the screen and go to the presentation. Hmm. Is it the slide? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. I think it is also opening in the time. I have opened a new version. Okay, here oh, it is. Okay. Yes. Because I couldn't find it. I think it was overlaid. All right, so can you see the uh, screen? Yes, yes, it is visible, Prof. So uh, for a while, I have been trying to produce this textbook, but as, as I said, the critique was there, but the alternative was not. So inshallah, I'm now starting to write this book. And uh, this lecture that I'm giving could be the first chapter in the sense that I'm trying to explain why I have to do this and what is the purpose of this. And hopefully uh, this will be done in a few months and then I will come to Indonesia to present it, inshallah. So, so first I have to explain about the first and the second and the third generations of Islamic economics. So the first and the third generation are agreed that we should build economics on the foundations of the Quran and the Sunnah and the Islamic intellectual tradition and the historical experiences of Islamic societies. 
and also that the Western societies, their economic, political, and social institutions are secular. They are built on the rejection of religion, rejection of God, rejection of Akhirah. And so we cannot borrow from them. As opposed to this, the second generation, which is currently the dominant generation in Islamic economics, believes that we can start with Western concepts and just modify them or adjust them. So uh, the Western theory of economics starts with microeconomics and microeconomics. So what we should do is we should take Western microeconomics and modify it to make it Islamic. And similarly, so these are uh, basic. So, so what the second generation does, it say, says we should start with Samuelson and then make adjustments to make this theory Islamic. So uh, first, we have to understand what is a society. A society is built on common goals. Everybody agrees that this is what uh, we are about. Uh, we have a common history. We have a common ideology, Islam, a common worldview, a way of looking at the world. And that's what makes a society. It's different from a collection of individuals. So Islamic societies are built on foundations of love, which unites each other so that every part feels the pain of others as per Hadith. So in an Islamic society, we have fundamental principles of cooperation, generosity, social responsibility, looking after each other and striving for success in the Akhirah, not in this dunya. Capitalist societies which are dominant around the world today and are dominant even in the Islamic societies today are built on rejection of Christianity. So they assume that man is, uh, because there is no God, so the universe came into existence by itself and evolution took place. So lots of animals got created and man is just another kind of animal. So the society is just a jungle and the law, social law is survival of the fittest. And so the basic uh, principles are competition, instead of cooperation, greed instead of generosity, individualism, everyone, and hedonism, which means maximize the pleasure in this dunya because there is nothing else. So how did this happen? Uh, a great transformation took place in European societies. Social theory based on the Bible, which was called scholastics, was rejected and replaced by a secular social theory. When people rejected the Bible, that meant that they had to build a knowledge from scratch, from zero. Because uh, in their society, just as in our society, the our, in our Islamic society, the Quran is the foundation for all knowledge. We know that the Quran is 100% certain and anything we build upon that is subject to human error. Uh, and this was the same idea in Christian society. But the Enlightenment thinkers said that we can reject everything that is known to the past, and we can use reason and logic and our observations to build knowledge which is 100% sure. And also it will be equally acceptable to our religion, so we will have not have this religious warfare anymore. So what is social theory, like economics, politics, etc.? Social theory is, explains what kind of institutions should there be, the, how should the government be run, how should the financial systems be run, how should the people have relations with each other. So societies are continuously changing, evolving. This is what the fundamental insight of Ibn Khaldun was, that societies are young and then they grow and they become mature and they become old and senile and fall into luxury. So as European societies change from Christian societies to secular societies, the theory of society also changed. See, as societies evolve and change, the social theories also co-evolve. They also change with the society at the same time. Uh, because obviously, as the society is changing, the theory of the society must change. But uh, one of the problems with the secular society was that they said that the theory that we are using is equally applicable to all societies. So it is universal and invariant. So even though the theory was developed from European historical experience, they claimed that it applies to all human societies. 
And this claim has been widely accepted by uh, Muslims. So today, even though the theory is a European theory, Muslims think it also works in Islamic societies. And that's the great mistake. So uh, Europeans colonized the world and they destroyed indigenous social institutions. So the Islamic societies had their own ways of governance and, and uh, finance and uh, agriculture and medicine. Everything was, this was all destroyed and replaced by European institutions and European social theories. So today, uh, the critical, one of the critical institutions is the educational institution. The educational institutions teaches about the society. And so today, the Western society's social theories are being taught around the globe to Muslim students. And we are also trying to design our societies like Western societies. So the Western secular uh, theory of knowledge is fundamentally wrong because observations and logic which they say leads to the truth is not enough. And this was already noted by Imam al-Ghazali more than a thousand years ago. And you can easily prove this by many different methods. So if you have observations and logic, you must add some metaphysical assumptions and some moral assumptions. Uh, without that, you cannot get anywhere. Unfortunately, this is very critical to understand, uh, secular modernity, the current dominant epistemology all over the world, concealed, they hide their metaphysical assumptions. And they say that we don't have any. Uh, why is that? Because they wanted to build a knowledge that was equally acceptable to all religions. So all religions have some metaphysics. And so if you metaphysics is knowledge that cannot be derived by observations and by reason. But if you have such then you cannot expect agreement from all of human beings. So the reason for this error uh, was that centuries of religious wars led to rejection of the Bible. And the solution of the Enlightenment professors was to build consensus, eliminate religious differences by creating objective knowledge which would be equally acceptable to all. But the problem that they didn't understand then and nobody understands today is that this is impossible. Uh, you cannot build knowledge on observations and knowledge, knowledge. So the consequence of this error, which are very important, is that there is hidden metaphysics and hidden morality. And because you conceal the metaphysics and the morality, you have the appearance of objectivity and universality. And what this means is that the idea is that Western social science, which was developed in Europe, applies to all societies. And this is a wrong idea, but this is the major problem today that Muslims uh, and Islamic economists of the second generation think that Western economics is partly true and partly wrong, and we should take some of their true things and reject their errors. And whereas, in fact, all of the social sciences are lessons derived by the West on how to build a secular society, how to build a society without religion. So there are five fundamental metaphysical questions. Why was this universe created? What is the position of man in this uh, universe? What is the code of conduct we should follow? What is the best form of a human society? And at the bottom of all of these questions is what is the nature of knowledge? What is knowledge? How do we find uh, the truth, how do you evaluate something and know if it is true or false? These questions are metaphysical because you cannot find the answers using observations and knowledge, uh, observations and logic. Because how was the universe created? Observations only go until the beginning of the universe. You cannot go behind to see what was happening at that time when the universe was not there. And so our logic is also human and constrained to the things that we can observe and see, and we cannot go around. So we need the revelation to find out about this. So in Islamic social science, the universe was created by God as a testing 
place for human beings. In Western social science, universe was created randomly by an accident without any purpose. Uh, man is the best of creation, uh, according to the Quran. Man is just a kind of an animal, according to the West. Morality is given by the God, and it's written in the Quran and the Sharia, but also it's built into human nature. It's in our hearts. Our hearts are able to recognize the true and the good and distinguish between the false and the evil. Uh, but the West says there is no morality. Uh, in the what is the nature of society? All of the creation of God is the family of God. So all human beings are one family and we should love each other and try to take care of each other. In the Western social science, uh, it's about the survival of the fittest in the com uh, cutthroat competitive jungle. So if I get the chance, I will kill you. You get the chance, you can kill me. And uh, finally, the knowledge. So in Islam, the most certain knowledge comes from God, the Quran, and all human knowledge is built upon this foundation of the Quran and the Sunnah. But this knowledge, we cannot be sure of because we are human beings, we can make mistakes. All of our greatest ulama, when they would give a fatwa, they would say, this is the opinion of my own self, but I am a weak and humble human being and I can make mistakes. So if you find something better, you should follow that one. As opposed to this, the Western social science is built on the idea that by using our observations and logic, we can be 100% sure of what we, knowledge we derive. So what are the consequences of Western metaphysics? So if we say that the universe was created as an accident, then our lives are completely meaningless. Whether we do something or don't do something, do good, do evil, there is no, no meaning to it. And there's no higher purpose, no visions, no bigger goals that we can strive for. Humans are animals, so that means that we should pursue pleasure and power and profits. So this is built into economics. The human beings in economics are rational if they pursue pleasure. The firms are rational if they pursue profits. Uh, this theory fails on both normative and positive grounds. That is, if you are a human being and you want to maximize your happiness and you don't believe in God, still you should not maximize uh, utility. Uh, because happiness does not come from eating and drinking. Happiness comes from having friends, uh, social relationships. It comes from character. It comes from sabr and shukr. So this is the normative failure. This is not even a good uh, goal to strive for. Uh, Easterlin paradox shows that uh, the happiness it does not result from consumption. Consumption leads to short-term happiness. If you're hungry and you eat food, then you get happy for a few moments, but then it's gone. But if you want to be happy for five years or 10 years, have a lifetime of happiness, then the hadith says the mu'min loves and is loved. This is one of the character traits of happiness. And the other is having a good character as described in the Quran. So the third principle is that there is no morality. And economic theory is built on the idea that there is no morality. So uh, in game theory, we study a situation where you and I, there's prisoner's dilemma. And if we cooperate, we can both get a decent result. But if I betray you, if I stab you in the back, I can get a better result. So according to economic theory, the rational behavior involves both of us stabbing each other in the back and both of us suffering as a result. But in human, um, in real life human situations, people make agreements that let us agree to cooperate and people carry out those agreements. Even though in economics, uh, they are not supposed to carry out those ag agreements because morality is meaningless. And so if you get benefit by, if the other person is stupid and he honors his word, then you should stab him in the back and get benefit for yourself. So the model of behavior for homo economicus is very different from the model of behavior of Islamic uh, society and also of normal human beings. So uh, what this is that society is life in a jungle, survival of the fittest. 
if you have the power to do something, that gives you the right to do something. And we can see that today where the people who have the power are doing whatever they want without any regard for morality. And finally, the idea that we can reach certain knowledge leads to epistemological, epistemological arrogance. Uh, our greatest uh, muftis and ulamas would say that, I don't know, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, in um, 2004, Robert Lucas, in the presidential address to the American Economic Association, said that we have solved the biggest problem of economics, which is the prevention of recession. So in 2007, he was proven to be wrong. But he was certain that he was saying the truth. In the There was a congressional investigation of the failure of economics after the global financial crisis. And so Robert Solo uh, testified at this and he said that the reason for this failure is that the model which is currently in use in uh, all over the world, the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, it has only one person, it has only one agent. So it's not possible for that one agent to deceive himself. But the global financial crisis occurred because on a large scale, the banks deceived the uh, consumers. So uh, the theory of economics claims to be certain, claims to be positive, claims to describe, but it is completely flawed and useless. It doesn't describe correctly what we see in the world and it does not, it is not correct normally. This is not how we should behave either. On the other hand, the self-portrait of economics is that this is a science, that the law of supply and demand is just like Newton's law of gravity. So what we need to do is to uh, reject all of that and uh, create a different uh, approach. And uh, the approach that I'm suggesting is called Ulum al-Umran. And again, this is I am not the creator of Ulum al-Umran. Many people have made the suggestion and the idea that we should build um, social science based on the ideas of Ibn Khaldun. And it is absolutely true that the ideas of Ibn Khaldun are very, very different from anything you can see in Western social science in any textbook or any, any methodology, any approach, whether it's orthodox approach or heterodox approach. So one of the critical things that the, is that societies are continuously evolving and changing. So they are young and energetic, then they become mature, then they become older. So the theory must also be evolving and changing because as the society change, the theory of the society must adapt to this change. So one of the consequences is that there is no equilibrium because things are continuously changing. And since societies are changing, optimization is not possible. So basically, modern economic theory is built on these two concepts, that there is equilibrium and uh, everybody optimizes. The firms maximize their profits, the consumers maximize their pleasure. So both of these key concepts on which the whole of modern economics is built are wrong. Uh, the critical... Um, object of study for Ibn Khaldun was what are the factors which drive social change? How do we study social change? So one of the, his concepts was uh, asabiya. Uh, we will discuss that later. But one of the important things to understand is that social theory is always local. That is, you have a society, it is changing. So to study uh, how that change is happening, you have to study that particular society. So you have to look at a particular time, place, geography, society, culture, beliefs, everything. And uh, then you can study that society and you can ask what will happen next. So there are never universal theories. This is the critical thing. That So there is no science. There is no social science because there is no theory which applies to all societies at all times. Even in one society, the theory that uh, social theory that applies to Pakistan in 2024 is different from the social theory which applies to Pakistan in 1971. And so uh, 
this is one fundamental uh, principle that society, uh, social theories are continuously changing. They cannot be fixed and they cannot be universal and invariant and always applicable to all societies. And so even the word social science is wrong because it is not a science. Science, you see, law of physics, it applies the same in Pakistan and England and applies the same in 19th century and 20th century, but this is not true for uh, social theories. So some of the critical features of Ibn Khaldun's theory is that the social classes are bound together by a sabiya, which is the kinship relationship. Now this concept is no longer relevant or valid, but the bigger idea remains the truth that uh, social societies are built by social cohesion, how much we love each other, how much we are connected to each other. So uh, if we have, if we are uh, exactly, this is the problem with modern economics that it says everyone is an individual, there is no connection between two. So if I can uh, find a more beautiful woman, then I should divorce my current wife and uh, uh, marry a new woman because it will maximize my pleasure. So what about my commitment, responsibility? All of this is uh, not relevant in the uh, Western social theory. So the, uh, the critical driver of social change is how much we love each other, how much we, how strongly united we are as a community. And modern economic theory breaks down this, modern social theory breaks down this connection and breaks down societies. So... Uh, that's one of the concepts at the heart of Ulum Ulumran. The second concept is very important is that as we observe this social change, we see, we try to understand what is going on. Why is the society changing? So, for example, we see in Islamic societies that there is a lot of westernization going on. So what are the factors which drive this? So, as I said, one of the factors is Western education. Uh, so today we have um, so, so we make a theory about the factors and then we try to intervene, we try to prevent this change. So the social ch change, uh, we study it when develop theory, the theory leads to a policy and then we implement this policy to try to manage the social change. So this policy also creates social change, uh, maybe good, maybe bad. So what this means, what is important here is that human beings are in control or in partial control of the social change process. Their social change is also driven by many external factors which we cannot control, but we also can implement policies to try to manage or control the social change. So human beings have an active role to play. This is very different from Western social science in which human beings are robots. They act according to mathematical laws. They cannot change themselves and they cannot change society. So, there are three types of models in use uh, in economics. One is the classical economics, which is based on equilibrium and optimization, which was based on 19th century physics. It's the study of systems which are not changing. Uh, when physics itself evolved, they said, oh, equilibrium is not useful. And they started building dynamic models, models where change occurs according to the laws. So we have meteorites and we have planetary motion. We have things which are continuously changing, but there are laws which govern this change. And so there are a number of economists who are working on dynamic models. And this is an advance and an improvement over classical economics. But there's a problem with dynamic models. Dynamic models study systems which are changing according to mathematical laws. They don't have room for this uh, human agency. Human beings think and make a plan and change how the society is changing. So this cannot be predicted by law because we have freedom. We can choose one theory or another theory. So for this, the correct tool is agent-based models. And I have a couple of lectures on this, which I can provide links to later, inshallah. So agent-based modeling is the right way to model a human society in which human beings control the change. I want to illustrate the how the societies are changing and the theories are changing together with the societies. So in 16th to 18th century, there was continuous European wars. 
and mercantilism was the theory of economics uh, because for wars you needed gold and so mercantilism emphasized the acquisition of gold. If you have more gold, you can uh, run your wars more correctly. In the 19th century, there was relative peace in Europe. Europeans were not fighting each other. Instead, they were out uh, conquering the world. So then trade became more important. So the theory changed, and that was the Adam Smithian th theory. And the sterling and the gold standard was a very important factor in enabling trade. And UK dominated the globe because of its sterling standard. But in World War I, uh, the European economies, the whole world was conquered and, and they were just continuously fighting. So they started to fight each other. And when they fought, fought each other, then they ran out of gold. And so the monetary standard changed. So between World War I and World War II, uh, monetary standards were very different. In World War II, Bretton Woods Agreement put the dollar in as a standard in 1971, uh, the Nixon shock removed the gold backing from the dollar. And in 1999 to 2000, some laws were passed which allowed shadow banking to take place. So basically any private institution can create any amount of money. And this is what led to the global financial crisis of 2007. And also this led to a crisis in economic theory because economic theory was not built to understand this kind of money. The economic theory that we have today being taught in the textbooks is the gold standard theory. And so the gold standard theory is no longer valid, but it's still, uh, the theory has not caught up to the change. So um, let's look at the evolution of Islamic economics. So in uh, Europe, uh, the secular society says that religion is a private belief. And uh, so you should have, how should we organize society? Previously, it was done by <laughs> deen, uh, Christian deen, and then it was replaced <clears throat> so by what we can call secular deen. Deen is a way of organizing society. It's not a belief system. <coughs> so our Islam is a private belief system. Uh, it tells me about how to connect my heart to Allah. But it's also a social theory. It tells us how to run society. So in Christian societies, the private belief of Christianity remained, but the deen, the Christian way of organizing society, was replaced by a secular deen. And so uh, in this deen, in secular deen, there were, became three branches, capitalism, communism, and socialism. Each of these are theory about how human society should be organized without reference to religion. So in World War I and World War II, uh, European powers fought each other and millions, 50 million lives were lost. So Europe became very weak. So the colonizations, the, the former colonies, the Islamic world became independent. But although, um, so in the fight for independence, the first generation of Islamic economists said that we have our own system which is superior to capitalism, communism, and socialism. That is the Islamic system. But after the freedom, we achieved political freedom, but we didn't achieve mental freedom. And so after the freedom, the, the people who were in power were the people who were very strongly in love with the West and they believed in Western theories. So they implemented these theories in their societies and uh, the education system develops love, admiration, and awe for the Europeans. And it also develops hatred and contempt for our own culture, for Islam, for traditions, for heritage. And so today also all over the Islamic world, the class which is in power loves the West and hates uh, the East. So this is why the ruling classes continued the colonial systems, the colonial systems were designed to extract revenue from the people and give them, send them to England or uh, France or <clears throat> other, uh, Spain or Portugal. Uh, so after the independence, the ruling classes continued the same system. They continued to extract money from the population, but instead of sending it to Europe, they just 
uh, kept it in their own pockets. So the Islamic system, which the first generation had theorized, could not be implemented because we didn't have power. And this is what led to political Islam. A lot of people started to try to capture the power so they, they could implement an Islamic economic system. But by 1976, after about uh, 25 years of effort, the Muslims realized that we're not going to be able to capture government. So they said, okay, let's work with what we have, capitalism, and modify it. So that was the birth of second generation Islamic economics. Uh, so what they, 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 these, instead of the first generation was revolutionary, the second generation was pragmatic. It said, okay, let's take what we have and try to change it to become uh, Islamic. So in this, uh, they made many mistakes. So they accepted many ideas of Western economics, which were wrong and uh, in conflict with Islam. So one, just one example, the first generation had rejected scarcity and they had said that uh, Allah Ta'ala, Fadlullah, Allah Ta'ala is bountiful and he gives plenty. So there is no scarcity. But the second generation studied capitalist economics and they said, no, 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 no. Scarcity is a plain fact. And so they um, modified the interpretation of the Quran in order to make scarcity uh, come out as true. And there was a reason. They wanted to modify capitalism and they were trained in capitalist economics and they learned to believe in the ideas. So basically in critical areas where there was a conflict between second generation, <clears throat> between uh, Samuelson and, and Quran, the second generation accepted Samuelson and reinterpreted Islam. So one was scarcity versus fazlullah. Another one was utility maximization versus prohibition of Israf and Tabzir. Utility maximization said you should, you should pursue your idle desires. Uh, and uh, Israf and Tabzir says no. So the second generation say no, utility maximization is correct. And the Israf and Tabzir don't have any meaning. So profit maximization versus ser service maximization was the ideal for um, Islamic firms. And again, they accepted the profit maximization idea. And they accepted the methodology, uh, the empirical, the quantitative and mathematical ideas, even though this was in conflict with the Islamic intellectual tradition. So the global financial crisis in 2007 led to a crisis in economic thought. Uh, economists could not explain what had happened. And since second generation Islamic economics was also tied to conventional economics, there was also a crisis in second generation. So now uh, there is one. <clears throat> so the third generation was born after this crisis. And people said that, oh, this is not working. The second generation methodology has not been able to produce anything. So let's try a new way. And so basically a lot of people are trying to return to the revolutionary perspective of first generation. But there's only one difference between third generation and first generation. First generation was tied to the idea of the nation state, that we must control the government in order to implement Islamic ideas. In third generation, we realized that government uh, cannot be captured. It's not as a thing. And also that the governments are hostile to Islam. So we want to work beyond the government. We want to work at the level of the ummah, a larger unity, instead of working at the nation state. And also we want to work at the level of the community instead of the individual. So our microeconomics is not based on individuals, it's based on communities, and our macro is not based on nation states, it's based on the ummah. So uh, we are running out of time. So basically we have five different questions and uh, uh, since it's a testing ground, this universe, uh, we must that the goal of our lives is to fulfill the orders of Allah. Man is the highest of creations. And so every man has the potential to rise um, above the angels and also the potential to fall below the beast. So the goal of our life is not to maximize profits and not to maximize wealth and not to maximize pleasure, but to achieve the hidden potential inside our hearts. 
everyone has every life is potentially worth equal to the all of human beings because if you save one life it is as if you have saved all of humanity so every human life every human being has enormous potential in the eyes of allah and the goal of our life is to realize that potential so morality i have already explained nature of human society is like a family and human knowledge is built on the quran and it is divided into useful knowledge and useless knowledge so prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sought allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'an wa a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa so we have to differentiate between useful knowledge and useless knowledge so modern economics is useless knowledge from which we seek protection and useful knowledge enters our heart and enables the ma'rifah of allah so we can see allah taala in the our hearts and also in the world around us and so basically the goal of our life is to turn all of our life into an act of worship including the economic acts of buying and selling and uh, and uh, consuming and agriculture everything should be according to the orders of allah so that it is an act of worship so i have some specific features in this book i will base it on history and on social theory which is evolving and changing uh one of the critical things that i want to ensure is that the how the quran is applied changes from time to time so for example the quranic command is to protect the ummah from attack now in the times of the prophet this involved learning archery and horse horse riding but later we had to learn how to shoot guns and today maybe we learn how to use artillery and drive tanks similarly uh the process by which we feed the hungry is very different today than the process in the middle ages and the process in the early times of islam so there are two common mistakes many people have realized that we need to develop social science but there are two common mistakes one is to say that we already have the social science so we can just take the books of imam abu hanifa and apply them without change so the thing is that actually social science is continuously evolving and we have to use the usul fiqh to derive the correct way to do things today and the other opposite mistake is to think that social science is universal applicable to all societies at all times we do, we don't need uh, science because west already uh, rebuilt Uh, built social science so to end this we can say that knowledge is the central battleground the period of jahiliya was the period of ignorance allah taala gave us knowledge which enlightened the world and today again the world is enveloped in darkness of jahiliya which the west calls enlightenment and again the quran has the power uh, to change this darkness into light Uh, the problem the biggest problem is that today muslims are looking to the west for guidance instead of the quran so the quran tells us how to build human society and um, basically uh, we have to be pragmatic we have to start from where we are and take small steps towards the goal so let me end by dua allahumma arina haqqa haqqan warzuqna ittaba'a وأرنا باطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين so let us stop share here جزاكم الله خير كثير بروفيسور زمان and now we are in the next agenda of uh, question and answers so for the participants uh, you can raise your hands or a uh, chat in the column uh, uh, in the chat box so anyone to ask you can raise your hand um assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam Uh, yes, uh, Professor Asa, uh, thank you for your lecture. I think it was a very, very uh, concise one-hour summary of the problem with Western social sciences and uh, and uh, and how we need to uh, 
to build our own uh, sociology based on our tradition and uh, and we, if that aspect I was not I was no, I, I've been reflecting on uh, on Ahya Ulumuddin, the uh, quarter two. So, uh, so as we know, the the Ahya has four uh, four quarters. The quarter on uh, the quarter, the ten, the first ten books on uh, on Ibadas, and the second ten books on Adas. And Adas is uh, is actually the norms of daily life, meaning the adapt of friendship, adapt to the guests. Adapt of eating, adapt of business, adapt of <laughs> so uh so I was thinking well, so so the adapt is is actually the 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 best our like it's like the archetypical practice of a of of uh of the Islamic society. You know, I I think I I think by studying the second quarter that the uh book uh book twenty uh book uh book eleven to book twenty of the here I I think. We can derive a uh, like basic framework for uh for Islamic sociology, uh at, at least the um, the uh, the moral norms of daily life uh, uh inside the home and uh, and in the public uh, places, uh, which is interesting. Uh, it was it's only then. Uh, in the third quarter, that uh, that Imam Azali goes into the task of meaning uh, the quarter on the uh, on the mathumas on the wisest of the soul, and then the last ten books on the uh, on how to uh, on the munjias on that uh, on uh, on the virtues uh, of the soul. So so it seems that that taskia is not possible unless you are in a society. That has that norm that that so, I mean I mean you can I mean you you cannot be a clean guy if you uh, raise up in a nightclub right I mean so 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 there needs to be like like, like social environment like the ambience so I, I think you say that but but I think uh in most uh that's, that's one thing but so uh but um well, that's one point that I, I think uh again but I think we need to study the second quarter of the area uh, carefully. Because we can derive certain uh uh like social norms norms that uh that once govern Islamic society. Uh, okay, the second point is that um I noticed that in your last slide uh that yeah uh, I think yes I, I think it's not just a social sciences but also uh aspect of the natural sciences like for instance like in agriculture uh because even the net even the Western natural sciences, they're driven by values. So if you are greedy and profit maximization, then uh, then of course the research trend is towards biotechnology, high tech, genetic engineering. We, we mean you like change the creation, if you change the creation of mm -hmm. our lot and more profit. And and uh, whereas the uh, whereas the formal culture, uh, which is a mixture of traditional and modern, whole point is. Uh, is community of food self sufficiency and it's it's not about big business so so the approach is is different because ethics is different and because the ethics is different it, the ethics bring about the techniques that are a bit different than uh, than uh, than also so um so um so uh, so in this aspect even western na uh, natural sciences and technologies there are certain uh, hidden uh, Hidden uh, biases, especially now when uh, when the science. I mean, okay, when the natural sciences and technology, the funding for research is now controlled by the big companies. I mean, they fund they fund everything, and only uh, those type of technologies that fit into the corporate maximization of profit that that tends to get more funded. Whereas, like more localized and more natural type of technology, like permaculture or organic farming or um, or, or what Schumacher call um appropriate technology, like technology that is appropriate to appropriate to local context. So uh, all that is totally uh, neglected uh, in mainstream uh, academia. So 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 uh, so I just like to maybe we need we need to qualify uh, uh, certain um, uh, certain aspects of modern technology. Uh, I think that's uh, that's my uh, my comment and. Uh, and I think this is a very nice uh, one-hour concise summary of the problem of 
the social sciences and keep expanding into a textbook, like textbook on the uh, on the uh, uh, on the problem with uh, with Western social, sociology, because that is the uh, that is the ground uh, from which the problems of, of Western economics came about. Right, but uh, <laughs> with that, uh, thank you. So uh, I started the ball rolling, and some of the others can uh, can chip in. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum. Wassalamualaikum. Well, you want me to respond? I would like to respond briefly. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, there is one thing. Yeah, you're right, absolutely right that the physical sciences have their own problems. But I think that <laughs> as a matter of priority, uh, we should focus first on the social sciences and then uh, on the physical sciences uh, for various reasons. Basically, it's because in all dimensions of our life, we are following Western models like the governance models and the no khilafa and shura, the politics, the economics, the social life. In every sphere of our society, we have uh, Western models. So just like the Hadith says that you will follow the ways of the uh, <clears throat> Christians and Jews to the extent of crawling into lizard holes or snake holes behind them. And this is what is happening. So... Uh, we need to reform society, then we will figure out how to use science properly. Uh, so that's a secondary matter. Actually, one of the key claims of the West is that physics science is the most important knowledge. And so we want to say, no, uh, how to build society is the most important kind of knowledge. Physical science is not very important. If we are living in a primitive society, that's not a problem. So that's one thing. The other thing is, the question we need to figure out is, suppose that we are in a nightclub. So is Islam impossible? No. Uh, we have to figure out how to live Islam in, in a nightclub. This is the problem that uh, today we are all trapped within capitalism. Also, there is no easy escape. So we have to figure out how to live Islam. So the <clears throat> within capitalism. Of, uh, and uh, if we do it correctly, then we will just end up destroying the system and changing it. But it cannot be done from the top as people tried and failed. So <clears throat> there is an analogy that um, Islam tells us the goal. So, um, for example, Islam tells us that you have to go to Kaaba to do Hajj. Now, how to get to Kaaba, Islam doesn't tell us. So if I'm in Rome, uh, I will have one path. If I'm in Nigeria, there will be another path. If I'm in Malaysia, there will be another path. Also, these paths will be changing in time. So if you are in um, earlier centuries, you have to take a ship. There are, airplane has not been invented. But in, uh, in later times, you can take an airplane. So the path that you take will depend on the time and place and circumstance. So that is why. And, and one of the big mistakes that reformers are making, are they're looking at what is happening near Kaaba. So they describe the Kaaba and say, okay, this is what you should be like. But... We, we are very far from the Kaaba. So the what we need to do when you are very far is very different from what you do when you get the near. So if you say that, okay, so in uh, near the Kaaba, you have to make the Tawaf, but we cannot start making the Tawaf because we are too far away. So first we have to get there. So people are not focusing enough on what to do in now, here and now, given the circumstances that we are in, so basically, the process of change should start with where you are, with what you have, with the resources available, and taking into account all of the hostile forces and the errors and the power of the shaitan and everything into account. In this situation, what is it that I can do that is positive? So those are the two comments that I wanted to make about yours. We can go on to the next if there is any other question. I've also put the correct link for the uh, Islamic economic courses on the chat. So, any other questions?
Looks like everybody understood everything. <laughs> Assalamualaikum, Prof. Asad. Waalaikumsalam. Um, uh, I would like to ask a question. Uh, I mean, as a Muslim, we understand <coughs> that the teaching of Quran is universal. Uh, just like you said that um, we have uh, challenges uh, in the economic theories, for example, uh, about the scarcity and abundance, the scarcity versus abundance. Yes. Um, and uh, when we want to shift our mindset uh, as a Muslim that uh, for the economic theories, is about the abundance. Um, yeah. I mean, we live in a, so a society that we are, uh, we live with uh, also the non-Muslim. Non uh, yes. I mean, my question is, uh, how can uh, we make Islamic economics is relevant and uh, to to them, to the to their, the, the non-Muslim, uh, what is the challenge uh, when we uh, have to face the non-Muslim mindset? Uh, uh, I mean, they, they don't really know about the Quranic teaching, but when we, we want to apply this Quranic teaching, uh, what is the challenge uh, we face uh, in the society, in, in a society uh, where we live with Muslim and non-Muslim? Non yeah. Uh, I think that the best way to invite to Islam is to build a good Islamic social model. If you have an uh, uh, Islamic community which is built on principles of love and cooperation and generosity, people will norm automatically be attracted to it. It is in this world that uh, it has become increasingly indi individualistic, competitive, money-oriented, no meaning in life. So if people see a community where people are working together, living together, sharing with each other, and being kind to each other, uh, they will automatically want to join. You don't have to give any dawa or explain. But while your Islamic communities are not organized according to Islamic principles, then there is no point in giving dawa because you're, if your house is very... Uh, chaotic and disorderly and messy, how will you invite a guest into it? You cannot. Thank you, Ravasat, for the explanation. Yeah, I'd just like to add, uh, add on, uh, on, uh, on the sister's question. Uh, the, uh, I think a clear example is uh, when the Prophet moved or emigrated from Mecca to Medina, uh, he built the masjid and soon after that, he established a market of the Muslims. So uh, he did not say boycott the market of the Jews, but the market of the Jews are so bad and you know, they're, they're cheap. See, he simply just uh, chose a strategic spot uh, in Medina and, and established a market of the Muslims, was an ethical market. So, and after some, some time, the ethical market of the Muslim became the main market, and even the Jews and non muslim also preferred to trade and to trade there in that market. So, uh, yeah, so I think, I, I think we, yeah, as, as Prophet al said, we, we, we need to show our, our transactional ethics. I mean, uh, if you can show it, if, if you have a shop and we give fair price, Honors and uh, and if we have uh, non muslim employees, we, we we pay them well. I think this will attract the non okay the non muslims to uh, to 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 Islam, but first through our public ethics through uh, through through our muamala life because the muamala I mean we attract them through our fair dealing in the world, right? So I think uh yeah and I I think uh yeah I, I think that that's my answer I think and um. I just have to add, uh, just just last last uh, last week, uh, I I came back from a very nice five day retreat uh, with Tamsis, uh, the BMT Tamsis in Yogyakarta, and and I think uh, I think if we bring non Muslim right and and uh, like to non Muslim from from the West to do that retreat or, or to join the Tamsis, 
program, I think they will be very attracted to uh, <laughs> to Islamic economics <laughs> as practiced by uh, by Tamsis. It's so it's so uh, it's so. Uh, it's so uh, so I, I think I, I think we need to show our model. I mean, because and then at, at the end of the day, our practical work attract can. I mean, if you just talk and chaka, but 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 where is the work? Where is the bukti on the ground? Where is the proof in our action? I think then, uh, then I I, I think that. Uh, but I think th this is the right time uh, now because many people in the West they are so fed up with the current system. Everybody like in the US, so many people are homeless. People cannot find work. Even professor, they have to live. Uh, they have to live in their cars but they have got the rent the rent of the house are so uh, 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 okay so expensive so people really are, are really trying to find a solution i think in islam we have that solution uh because we have uh, a thousand years of experience it's just that we muslim need to recover our, our own mamala and we muslim need to repractice our own mamala before we can show it to the non muslim right so uh, yeah so as Professor Asad said, we uh, when uh, when we have a good model, even a small one, then the non-Muslim will be attracted to us by fitra because everyone, uh, including including non-Muslim, they will love justice in transaction, uh, ehsan in transaction, a fair price, fair deal, fair exchange. That that is fitra. So uh, yeah, I think. Um, and, and the proof of that is the market of the Muslim that the Prophet was not established uh, uh, in the uh, in Medina, and uh, he doesn't need to call for boycott. He just he, he just did his own thing, and and eventually people will can see difference. Okay, this is a market that is cheating, and this is an alternative market that is fair. So people can tell the difference. Inshallah, right? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Adi. Especially in Indonesia, Islam was spread by traders by their honesty and integrity. So this is a uh, yeah, special... yes, yes, that's true. That's true. <laughs> it's true. The whole of the Far East. Yeah. Yes. Mm, okay. Uh, Jazakumullah here for uh, Dr. Adistia and Prof. Asad Zaman. And we have maybe uh, one question more before we close the webinar. Mm. Uh, Prof. Asad, maybe I will ask. Uh, so nowadays we are in the, uh, we are in the position of the loss of adapt. So like you mentioned before, we have uh, no morality. So like uh, the competition in economic is so, is so individualistic and it brought <laughs> more war like uh like war in Gaza right now, so mm, I want to ask uh, regarding this this what happening, uh as a true believers for Muslim, uh how we implemented uh how we implemented the Islamic economy that brought us a peace a peaceful life, and then uh uh that brought a, a peaceful life and then also uh. And then also how uh, how we uh protect ourselves from the facing the Islamophobia like uh, like today's. So, um, some this dunya has been built as a testing ground for us. So there will be fitna, there will be facade, there will be bloodshed, there will be corruption. So um, the methods for dealing with this have been. Described for us, there is um, um, many different uh, examples for us from the life of our Prophet Sallallahu In different situations, there are different strategies. So we cannot discuss the details of that, but basically Islam provides us with guidance on how to handle problems of justice and injustice and how to deal with it on both a personal level and on a social level. So I think that is one aspect of your question. Uh, in terms of, uh, see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did three things which are critical. 
And I think these are critical uh, today. You build a masjid, what is masjid? Masjid is a place for collective prayer. This is very important. Not, not a place where people uh, sit in their homes and everybody makes worship. Everybody gets together. And then they used to discuss the social problems. And he also established Mawakhat, the brotherhood between the Ansar and the Muhajirin. So this also created love. And Allah Ta'ala mentions this love in the Quran. He says that, I put the love in your hearts and, and uh, if you had tried to buy this love with all of the gold in the world, you would not have been able to do so. So this uh, unity of the Ummah is the critical, and, and Quran, Allah Ta'ala says that if you are united, then the enemy will never be able to succeed against you. And so this is what the basis of the divide and rule strategy being used against us. Uh, the Today the Muslims are divided into group and they are um, being taught to hate each other and fight each other. In fact, nation state is designed specifically, there is a book written on how it was created so that Muslims would keep fighting each other. And we are following this uh, trap. So we have to learn to think between beyond the nation state and to think at the level of the unity of the ummah. And we have to uh, develop love in our hearts. But love in our hearts is not an abstract concept. You have to do this practice in your community, which is very hard because you may not find, you may find the person that you are trying to uh, develop love for, you don't like him at all. His uh, character is very bad. He's loud and harsh and he behaves in ways that you, you just hit. But then, <clears throat> so this is why the uh, the hadith says that the people who will have the shadow of the arsh, they will be people who loved each other for the sake of Allah. So this is very critical. I mean, personally, your heart, you don't want to be with him. You don't want to make friends with him because his personality clashes with yours. But because Allah Ta'ala says that you are in the same neighborhood and you have to love him, so you love him in the formal way. That is, you treat respectfully, you don't, uh, I mean, even though your heart doesn't want to do this, you uh, you are polite, you give him gifts, and you respond. And so this is, this is loving for the sake of Allah when your heart doesn't want. And this is what is needed, because in a neighborhood, there are many different peoples, and there are many clashing personalities. Even among the Sahaba, the personalities of Umar ta'ala and Abu Bakr ta'ala were very much in clash with each other. They were very different from each other. But um, you find that they managed to learn and get along. And so this is the this is actually a practice how to build community. And so th this is the most powerful weapon that we have. So there is the market, which is the economic front, on which we have very clear and explicit and instructions which we are not following. And then there's the mawakhat, which is loving each other, uniting as a community. And there's the masjid, which is the collective action front. So all of these three things which we are not doing. And we cannot. And the, the problem is the people say, okay, let's do it on the global scale. Let's capture the nation. But if you can't, if, if uh, 40 people in, in, in a neighborhood can't get together and make collective decisions, how are you going to do it with a million people? So that's why we need to learn this in our neighborhoods first so that we can practice it on a larger scale. So I think that's an answer to your question, hopefully. Jazakallah, uh, Prof. Asa. I think it's a very clear explanation for me. Okay. okay. And then, uh, before we are continuing to the uh, to the last our last agenda, uh, we have a photo session. So oh. for all participant participant and the uh, honorable Prof. Asad Zaman and also uh, uh, Dr. Adistia can turn on the camera. So we have a photo session uh, conducted by Sister Fatima Zahra. Okay, uh, uh, picture, uh, one, two, three. Uh, once again, uh, one, two, three. Okay, thank you. Okay, 
And then the our our last agenda is a closing and prayer. To close program, uh, let's recite the Kafaratul Majlis. Uh, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika asyhadu alla ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilai. Alhamdulillah alamin. Finally, from the deepest of my heart, I do apologize for my uh, for my mistake in presently in presently this event. Jazakumullah uh, khair for your kind attention, uh, especially for Professor Zaman and Dr. Adisitya. Uh, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Dr. Adi. Thank you so much. Yeah, see you next week, insyaAllah, Dr. Adi. Assalamualaikum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.